Good evening. Thank you for joining us on the News at 7 on NT International. We're live in Abuja. I'm Ruth Aguela. Let's bring you the headlines. Senate moves to remove age limit in recruitment into public service. State of economy during coronavirus in focus as House Committee on National Planning embarks on oversight function. Plus, the world marks Youth Skills Day with a focus on skills acquisition during pandemic. Let's begin with FEC. The Federal Executive Council um, has approved the medium-term expenditure framework and fiscal strategy paper for 2021 to 2023. The document projects 12.66 trillion naira as budget size for the 2021 fiscal year. Minister of State for Finance, Budget and National Planning announced this while briefing newsmen after the Council's meeting presided over by President Muhammad Buhari. State House correspondent Adam Musambo reports that the meeting is the 16th in its series for the year 2020. It is the 7th to be held virtually in compliance with the COVID-19 social distancing guidelines. Alongside the President in the Executive Council Chambers, Vice President Professor Yemi Oshibajo, Secretary to the Government of the Federation, Chief of Staff to the President and about 10 Ministers. The Head of Service of the Federation and all the members of the Council participated online from the offices across the nation's capital. Several memoranda from ministries, departments and agencies are billed for consideration for possible approval. Members observed a moment of silence in honor of the former Federal Commissioner for Works in the 70s, Major General Obada, who died last weekend after a brief illness at the age of 81. Let's look at all the issues as the world continues to grapple with the challenge of coronavirus. The time for stock taking on the impact of the pandemic on skills development and explore how young people can respond to the economic crisis is now. This is coming as the world celebrates Youth Skills Day. In this special report, correspondent Olayin Kaojo takes a look at the significance of this year's theme, Skills for a Resilient Youth in the Era of COVID-19 and Beyond. Designated by the United Nations General Assembly in 2014, 15 July annually is observed as World Youth Skills Day to celebrate the importance of equipping young people with skills for decent employment and entrepreneurship. We have male hairdressers, so we could, can also have um, female barbers. So I don't think there's anything wrong with having female barbers. The heat press and the cutting plotter work hand in hand. After you take the material that you're finished writing on the cutting plotter, you peel it and take it to the heat press where you can paste it on your t-shirts with the heat. Statistics by the United Nations indicates that today, there are more than 1.1 billion young people between 15 and 24 years, and they account for 16% of the global population. And because of their population, young people are almost three times more likely to be unemployed than adults. Every organization, beyond employing, beyond creating wealth, should have a mini training center. Today, due to COVID-19 pandemic, more than one in six young people are out of work. Since this year's celebration, though virtual, is coming amid unprecedented global crisis, helping young people to be more resilient to changes caused by the current crisis and in the world of work in general, especially in sectors hardest hit by COVID-19, is necessary. It is estimated that 70% of the world's learners are affected by school closure across education levels currently as this pandemic threatens the continuity of skills development. Uh, apart from maybe building of hubs, some of them can like, uh, okay, for instance now, maybe uh, if I have a younger brother that I know he's been idle at home, instead of him sitting down at home while I hustle, I, I can actually tell him, okay, come with me to the office, learn one or two. The latest global employment trends for youth 2020, technology and the future of jobs, show that since 2017, there has been an upward trend in the number of youth not in employment, education, or training. 
And in the face of these challenges, distance training has become the most common way of imparting skills. Digital skills, which have become an advocate, that beyond the paper certificates that we have now, the youth need to have a level of digital skills and literacy, which is a hard on. As the global fight against COVID-19 continues, experts are of the opinion that achieving better socio-economic condition for today's youths in terms of challenges of unemployment and underemployment is key. Olayin Kaujo, NTA News. And joining us in the studio to speak further on the World Youth Skills Day is Joy Osomiahe Onuma Juro, founding partner, African Scholars Care Initiative. Welcome to NTA International News. Thank you very much, Ruth. Thank you for welcoming me. Okay, now let's start by understanding the significance of the World Youth Skills Day and the central message of this year's event, considering the theme, which is skills for a resilient youth in the era of COVID-19 and beyond. What can you tell us? Um, yes, I must say um, thanks once again, Ruth. And um, brilliant report from your reporter if I got his name right, or Lying Kaojo. Yes. Yeah, um, this is this yes um, theme is um, skills for a resilient youth. Let's pick up that line, yeah. It's just trying to give us a sensitization, saying, okay, as a youth advocate, who, which I am right now, I would say um, the youth needs to wake up. This is a call for youths to wake up. We need to look inward. It's not just about them um, lazing around and creating gaps and lacunas within the economy. We could do better. We could, do, we could have opportunities to do more than we are doing today. We would like to use the opportunity to thank the government for what they've been doing so far. And then we employ them to do more. This is a, this is a, big, um, like a big project. And then the government alone cannot do it. We need an inclusion of the youths in every facet of the economy. So we're calling on every border, the private sectors, the, the NGOs, churches. We need to get the youths to be skillfully engaged. And this is just like a wake up call. Okay, and talking about this wake up call, I'm sure you're familiar with the saying that entrepreneurs rule the world. So what is the role of your organization in sensitizing Nigerians on acquisition of skills for nation building? Um, on this, um, um, uh, Ruth, permit me to digress a bit on your question. I would have to go from a personal experience. Um, like I said earlier, before I um, dropped on this, I, I said the youths have to look inwardly. I'll take myself as an example. For example, I finished school um, in Nigeria 2012 when I left university. There was no job. Yeah, coming from a background of uh, a learned mom who is a lecturer and a dad who owns a a private school. I went home to home teaching children private lesson. In church I was teaching catechism. You know, people could bear me witness because you if you know me from my religious background or you know my personal background, it was my hustle. I teach children and get paid. Te I've always wanted to have my own institution, my own academy, but the funds were not there. Yeah. When people saw my passion, you know, there was kind of support. And five years down the line after BSC in 2017, by God's grace, I was able to establish a nursery and primary school, which has actually been affected by this lockdown, yes. But the nursery and primary school has been on since 2017, up until 2020. And I've been able to raise at least 50 children learning under my academy. Okay. That is my own brain chap. And I'm paying people, over 18 staffs, in this organization so that's why i'm saying we can as youths of nigeria we can look inward and see what we can do to bridge the gap and give back to the society Instead well i must commend you joy it. let me hold your thoughts there you're doing a very good job but following the lockdown of institutions of learning as a result of the um, pandemic what would you say is the future of vocational training in post-covid era if we have to move forward now, the, the, the future of vocational training um, would say that there's a big gap there, and that's why we are calling on people to, to look at this. Because if you see, since the period of this um, um, lockdown, um, the um, youths not in, um, in employment, education, or training, there's been some kind of uh, pause in the system. 
If you say, yes, you're doing some kind of digital learning, virtual learning, how many people are engaged? We have so many problems that would even make digital learning not flow very well in this part of the world. The lack of lights, the insufficient funds for data. The, so it, it, in, in all of this, we, we, we would have to look at the... The, the ministries and the government agencies and even private sectors in the communication system to help us make it a bit, you know, more comfortable, especially in the vocational institutions that okay. have to do training for youths. Because if we don't have all these facilities in place to run this ICT virtual learning, how will this work? All right. Uh, that's where we'll call it off. Thank you very much, Joy. No doubt this is a wake-up call for youths to be resilient uh, against all odds. And looking at odds, let's look at COVID-19 um, update. Restrictions are being reimposed in many countries around the world due to rising cases of coronavirus and positive results from a United States firm as vaccine trials set to enter final stage. Let's now join Joyce Ometu for the global update. One hundred and sixty thousand people in the Spanish region of Catalonia returned to lockdown Wednesday as authorities struggle to control a fresh surge of coronavirus infections in the area. With more than 28,000 deaths from the pandemic, Spain's government ended a nationwide lockdown on June 21. But since then, cases continued to rise, prompting authorities to impose restrictions. Similarly, Hong Kong on Wednesday reinstated restriction measures as the Asian city battles a resurgence of the virus. Mask wearing has been made compulsory on public transport and public gatherings once again restricted to four people. And India has joined other countries across the globe in reimposing localized lockdowns. Records show that daily infections have been more than 28,000 for the past three days. Now a positive news as researchers in the United States say that the first vaccine tested in the country had worked to boost patients' immune systems and is set for final testing. The vaccine developed by the U.S. pharmaceutical company Moderna is expected to begin the last stage of its trials later this month. Statistics by Worldometer as at 6 p.m. indicates that 13,549,000 349 people globally have been diagnosed with COVID-19, while nearly 8 million have recovered and 583,415 have died. Out of these numbers, Africa records 630,528 cases, 13,820 deaths, while 318,570 persons have recovered. Nigeria currently has 33,000 616 confirmed cases, 754 deaths and 13,792 patients recovered. And that's a global update on COVID-19. Many thanks for watching. I am Joyce Umetu. Thanks, Joyce. The First Lady of Nigeria, Aisha Muhammad Buhari, has received a donation of personal protective equipment from the First Lady of the People's Republic of China, Professor Peng Liyong, as part of Chinese support in the fight against COVID-19 in Nigeria. The Minister Councillor of the Chinese Embassy in Nigeria, Zhao Yang, presented the items to the representative of the First Lady and Senior Special Assistant to the President on Administration and Women Affairs, Dr. Hajo Sani. State House correspondent Aliu Kabir reports on this and all the activities of the Nigeria's First Lady. Right, to apologize for the loss of audio in that report, we'll definitely bring it to you in our subsequent bulletin. Let's go on a break. We're back shortly. Stay tuned. The incessant reports of rape and sexual offenses in recent times is indeed worrisome. Are you a victim? It may be rape, incest, sexual abuse or sodomy. I have good news for you. NAPTIP implements the Violence Against Persons Prohibition Act and we now have the National Sexual Offenders Register which records the names of all perpetrators. This register 
aims to name and shame all perpetrators to serve as a deterrent. If you are a victim, seek help now, and we assure you that justice will be served. Register sexual abuse cases and perpetrators on www.nsod.naptip.gov.ng or call the Sexual Offenders Register hotline on 0703-0000203 or Naptip hotlines on 0803-220-3462. 0818-384-6635 Social media platforms and iReport app This message is brought to you by Naptip with support from Rolac funded by the European Union for staying tuned. Senate has called for the removal of age limit in the recruitment process of ministries, departments and agencies of government. This followed a motion of urgent public importance by Senator Ibrahim Gubir, which recommended that the federal government should direct the Federal Ministry of Labor and Employment to set up a committee to review the process. The legislators observed that the practice is responsible for age falsification by job seekers in a bid to fall within the age bracket stipulated. Senate has approved the report of its committee on finance on the 2020 budget of the Federal Inland Revenue Services amounting to 168 billion naira. The legislators approved a one-off special purpose fund of 100 billion naira for the service to enable it address some perennial financial needs such as the completion of its headquarters building. Senate also confirmed the appointment of Tela Adeniron Ramon as resident electoral commissioner of the Independent National Electoral Commission, representing Oshun State, and Usman Mahmoud Hassan as commissioner of the Revenue Mobilization, Allocation and Physical Commission. Still on legislative affairs, considering the economic situation Nigeria and other countries find themselves due to the global pandemic, the House of Representatives Committee on National Planning and Economic Development set out a fact-final mission to ascertain the level of preparedness of Nigeria's economic policies through the office of the Minister of State, Budget and National Planning in navigating the difficult terrains of bringing the country back on its feet. Economically, Chimobi Walter in Nigeria reports that members of the committee at the end of the meeting were optimistic that plans are already in place. Plans already in place would surely place the country on the side of economic growth. Economic recovery and growth plan expected to terminate by December 31st, 2020 and the introduction of a new national medium and long-term plan. This oversight visit by the House Committee on National Planning and Economic Development became expedient to cross the T's and dot the I's and ensure the plan is truly an inclusive one and will guarantee a sustainable growth. The Minister of State, Budget and National Planning, Clemi Kanadia Agba, noted that President Muhammad Buhari approved the new plan to be led by the organized private sector so as to ensure a true national development plan. We've had plans, but the issue of our plans has been that of implementation. And uh, one of the issues that we've had with the implementation is that those plans had not carried along these various diversities that I've talked about and gotten their inputs. And so if their inputs are not there, it means that there is an issue with acceptability and that of uh, implementation. The chairman, House of Representatives Committee on National Planning and Economic Development, 
Olododo Cook at Dugani, Saka, while appraising the ministry, said a more proactive measure need to be put in place, especially with the formulation of next year's budget, to focus on key development areas that will spur growth in the real sectors of the economy. Every administration come in, come as with different plans, vision 10, 10, vision 20, 20, vision 30, 30. Those are referred to our public, to our Nigerians. So these are the areas we want to show higher about. It was the consensus of both members of the committee and the ministry that all hands must be on deck to steer the country on the path of sustainable development. In Abuja, I'm Chimubi, Walter Naji, NT News. The Nigerian Labour Congress has commended the federal government for remitting 7.45 billion naira accrued rights and benefits into retirement savings account of the federal retirees covering April and May 2019. NLC President Ayuba Wapa, in a later address to the Minister of Finance, Zainab Ahmed, described the development as a responsible move by the government considering the adversity imposed by the retirees, imposed on retirees and pensioners by the coronavirus pandemic. NLC, however, urged the government to also consider the payment of retirees from June 2019 to July 2020. It further called for the implementation of the International Labour Organization's Centenary Declaration, which calls for universal access to social protection for all workers. And meanwhile, the Buhari Media Organization has described President Muhammad Buhari as a labor-friendly president following the federal government's decision to remit accrued rights and benefits of federal retirees to their retirement savings account. BMO, in a statement signed by its signed by its organized noted that the move showed that the Buhari administration will not shrink its responsibility to all Nigerians in spite of the global economic crisis in the wake of COVID-19. It said President Buhari would not tolerate a situation where COVID-19 or unstable oil prices would be an excuse to deny Nigeria's senior citizens and retirees their rights and benefits. BMO also commended the Nigerian Labour Congress for acknowledging that the decision came at, at a difficult economic time. The organization reminds Labour leaders that the latest one is a reflection of a directive that measures will be put in place to protect the vulnerable population at this time and reassured the NLC and other Nigerians to expect more Labour-friendly initiatives in spite of the adverse impact of the pandemic on the world economy. Let's look at agribusiness. The Apex Bank says adding maize to banned items is a measure to further boost local production, stimulate a rapid economic recovery, safeguard rural livelihood, as well as job creation. Musa Baba Ali in this report examines the impact of the development to agricultural sector of the economy. Maize is one of the most important crop in Nigeria, the second most consumed food after wheat. Most Nigerians depend on the produce as the main staple crop used for food and non-food products. Nigeria is currently the largest producer of maize in Africa, producing more than 33 million tons out of the 77 million tons the entire continent produces annually. The demand for the commodity as at 2015 is put at 17 million tons. In spite of this, processors of livestock and poultry feeds have been importing maize while the Central Bank of Nigeria provides forex for that purpose. This has been a major concern to maize farmers over the time. The maize that we are producing in Nigeria, we, are, we, we, we produced 20 million tons last year. And the, 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 the actual demand for all the maize processors, uh, uh, maize uh, human consumption is just uh, 80 million tons, which, which, which means that we have an excess of uh, over, over 2 million tons, so we have that capacity. For instance, the Katsana state governor, Amin Rebel in 2017, raised concerns over reported approval given to some companies to import 50,000 metric tons of maize. Similarly, in 2018, processors tendered a request before the National Biosafety Management Agency seeking approval to import certain tons of genetically modified maize, a development farmers frowned at. The permit that they have requested for is not necessarily we grant permit for importation of agricultural products. 
But once they are genetically modified, you somebody must file an application to the agency that we want to import genetically modified organisms. With local production of maize maintaining steady increase under the Anchor Borrowers Program, the Central Bank of Nigeria has added the produce to items banned for importation. The Apex Bank says the major is to further boost local production, stimulate rapid economic recovery, safeguard rural livelihood as well as jobs. In Abuja, Musa Baba Aliyu, NTA News. It's a sad day for the nation and rank and file of the Nigerian Air Force having lost the first female combat helicopter pilot, flying officer to Lulokpe Arutile. Defense correspondent Najata Tijani reports. Barely months after getting her wings, 23-year-old flying officer Tululokwe Arutili, in a twist of fate, lost her life in a road accident. A statement released by the Office of the Director of Public Relations and Information, Nigerian Air Force, described the service of late Arutili, who was commissioned into the Nigerian Air Force in 2017 as short but impactful having contributed to ongoing efforts at ridding the north central states of banditry and other crimes by flying several combat missions under operation gamma aiki in mina niger state amazing um, being in the air is fun it's nothing like the ground and i like it because it's, uh, it's a fun career and i'll just never get bored while paying tribute to Nigeria's first female combat helicopter pilot, the Chief of the Air Staff, Air Marshal Sadiq Abubakar, commiserated with her family and the nation over the irreparable loss. Najaa Tutijani, NTA News. Also, President Muhammad Buhari has received with deep pain the sudden demise of Nigeria's first female combat helicopter pilot, Flying Officer Tululokbe Arutili. He described the disease as a promising officer whose short stay on earth impacted greatly on the nation, especially in peace and security. The president salutes the officer's bravery in the field to protect the country from the onslaught of bandits and terrorists, saying her memory will remain indelible in the minds of Nigerians. He recalled her deft skills in maneuvering combat helicopters, which he personally witnessed with pride. The Nigerian leader commiserates with Arutile's family, Nigerian Air Force, the government and the people of Kogi State on the loss and prayed God to receive the soul of the departed and comfort those left behind. Similarly, the First Lady Aisha Muhammad Buhari has expressed her heartfelt sympathies over the demise of the flying officer Tululokbe Arutile saying the first female Nigerian Air Force combat helicopter pilot was an intelligent young woman who was a huge potential that represented both Nigerian women and youth. All right. That's the news and remember um, to connect with NTA and stand against rape and rapists. I'm Ruth Aguale. Bye. Mm -hmm.